Those are the key areas of cooperation between the two states. Take a look. Thank you, Balozi Finula Quinlan, for giving us this opportunity to interview you on this week's episode of The Diplomat. Great, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for coming. Balozi, to kickstart this conversation, tell us more about yourself. How is it like, you know, being a diplomat in a foreign country? Well, it's a, it's a really, really interesting job, and I'm super privileged to, to have it. Um, I guess what I love about it is it allows you to, well, obviously to live in a country, but to really... Um, really come to understand the or try to understand at least you know the political the economic the social the cultural aspects of the country um, and you get to you get to be in a country for around four years so it's quite a significant amount of time obviously there's an opportunity for you to you know to really experience Kenyan life um, which is just wonderful well Lucy, you previously worked as a journalist now how was it like you know transitioning from journalism to diplomacy there's a lot of shared skills between journalism and diplomacy and um, certainly you know as both the journalist and a diplomat you know you're very reliant on your network of contacts on you know the friendships and the relationships that you build the friendships and relationships of trust of course that you build and that allow you to do your job effectively then um, also, I mean, obviously, you know, we, we part of our job, of course, is trying to keep our headquarters informed on, 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 you know, what's happening here and issues of shared priority. So reporting is a very important skill. And of course, that's, you know, journalists do that. Um, and yeah, I found it, you know, I found it a very interesting transition. And I found the skills that I learned as a journalist served me very well in the in this role as well. How interesting has your diplomatic adventure been, you know, putting in mind that you had more than three countries yeah. in the Eastern Africa and, of course, Horn of Africa? I'd been, to, I'd been to this part of the world, you know, quite a few times before I took up my role as ambassador here, so I certainly was familiar with East Africa. Ireland actually has a very big footprint diplomatically here. Um, we've, we've, we've about eight embassies in, in East and Southern Africa and I've visited most of those. Um, but certainly Kenya, I mean, it's such a, geopolitically, of course, Kenya is really, really important. It's um, economically, it's very important in terms of, you know, in terms of East Africa, it's the economic powerhouse here. Um, and there's very good relations between Kenya and Ireland, very deep relations that go back more than 100 years. So having the opportunity to come here, to build on the amazing work that colleagues have done since our embassy reopened five or six years ago, and have the opportunity to advance, you know, in a mutually beneficial way, Ireland and Kenya's interests through, you know, we work with Kenya on um, supporting Kenya in terms of education, agriculture, private sector engagement. But really what, what, what we bring, I think that's probably a little bit unique is, Ireland is bringing our experience and sharing it with Kenya. Because we have quite a lot of shared experience. I mean, Ireland was also colonized. A lot of people may not, may not be aware of that, but we were colonized by England for about 800 years. And, you know, we, our country came into being 100 years ago, we gained our independence. And that, you know, that happened after, a, um, you know, a war for independence, a long, long independence struggle, a war of independence, followed, unfortunately, by a civil war. You know, so the birth of our nation, it's quite relatively new. Um, We've had to build all our institutions. We've had to, you know, really build our education system, try to attract foreign direct investment and, and so forth, and really become, you know, a very, um, a very successful agricultural economy, whereas many years ago we were a subsistence economy. So these are a lot of lessons that we, you know, that we've learned quite recently. We've made the mistakes on the way, and we, you know, as part of our development program, we're sharing that. Um, so those are some of the areas we're working with in Kenya. But also, of course, you know, we're building two-way 
trade, um, two-way trade and investment. It's very much a partnership that we have and trying to, like we had a trade mission, a very big and, and, and a trade mission led by our Cabinet Secretary for Trade in November of 2019. And we had about 40 Irish companies come here. I mean, they're very interested in Kenya in terms of being the Silicon Savannah, you know, the tech, um, construction, like um, life sciences. These are all areas that Irish companies are, are strong in and are looking to Kenya also for opportunities with. So I think there's certain- Ireland Embassy in Kenya has been supporting young scientists. Tell us more about that. Ireland has brought a, started a program in Kenya called Young Scientist Kenya. And it's very, very closely modeled on a science program that's been running in Ireland for more than 50 years. And again, I guess it comes back to us kind of trying to share our learning with Kenya where it makes sense to do so. And what's clear, I think, about both Kenya and Ireland is education is absolutely critical to the development of both countries. And for Ireland, that's what we saw. Like, we're not a country that has a lot of natural resources. We're on the, like, western edge of Europe, you know. So our resource is really our bright young people um, and Kenya of course has such brilliant young people and such a large young population now that really harnessing those skills and that ingenuity and creativity in a way that in a way that supports Kenya's development overall um, we think is really important and worth investing in so Young Scientist Kenya is basically a science competition that is run nationwide in Kenya President Kenyatta is actually our patron. Um, he's very, very supportive of it. And um, it involves, well, pre-COVID, I guess, what it involved was teams going out to schools in every 47 counties, teams of mentors, and, and really trying to engage the, the students, the secondary school students, in science, in technology, in engineering, and maths. Excite them about taking these subjects and excite them about pursuing careers in these subjects. So they'd have mentoring days, and then we'd encourage them to come up with, um, with a project that basically addresses a challenge. So that might be an irrigation problem or it might be a security problem. Or, but what was brilliant about it, and they would do these projects and submit them then to a national competition. And that national competition was held previously, it was held every year in Kenyatta, in the um, Kenyatta Convention Center. And you have 600 young people come from every county in Kenya with their brilliant projects. And they would, um, they would exhibit them to the public over three days. And then we would have teams of, ju teams of judges from you know, the universities and academics, and some people would come from Ireland as well to help judge those, those projects. And we'd have a series of winners. But what was really inspiring about those was when you would go to KICC and go around and see the, see the projects, like hundreds of projects, these were brilliant, bright young kids addressing problems in their communities. So, you know, just off the top of my head, some of them would be, for example, you know, maybe their mom or dad was a farmer and they were having issues with irrigation. So they would come up with pumps that could be operated by a car driving on the road, for example, or they lived in an informal settlement and there were security problems and they'd come up with solutions around that. Um, they were coming up with digital solutions to healthcare problems. And so, and what we hope to do is really through this program is of course encourage boys and girls, but particularly girls, because often the message to girls is that science and technology and maths are boys subjects, which of course patently they're not, um, but try to encourage them. And that's, you know, that problem is around the world. That problem of girls maybe not getting the same exposure as boys to these subjects is, 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 is global but try to encourage both to really see the potential for this. Because I think, you know, Kenya's, Kenya, I mean, when you look at Kenya, it's, it's, it's a world leader in some, in some aspects. You know, I mean, think of the mobile money, um, M-Pesa. That was, you know, that was something that Kenya invented and came up with. And I mean, I love M-Pesa, I use it all the time. It's so brilliant. But I'm just saying, you know, there's, there's great inventions like that, that, um, that Kenyans are taking forward and we really want to support that through this through this program and, and, and help Kenya's brilliant young people really try to realize their potential. Any other key development cooperation that uh, is being pursued by the island embassy and the Kenyan government? Two other significant ones is one we have a big pro program in agriculture um, and we have, a, we have a significant program in supporting the private sector environment as well. But if I take agriculture for a moment, because from our perspective, that accounts for about half of all our development funding here. And again, I guess it comes back to, if we look at Ireland's experience, so in the mid 19th century, Ireland suffered a really devastating famine. 
that you know led to the loss of a million lives and the immigration of, of about you know well over one and a half two million people um, and brought our population down by an enormous amount so we that that experience of famine is really embedded in in our in our um, DNA I suppose to an extent but if we take it forward so at that point a lot of Irish agriculture was really subsistence farming and then as we as we went along I guess there was an enormous amount and particularly within the last 50 or 60 years there's been a huge amount of investment and research and development and really um, thinking I suppose on how can we really build that that sector and you know now we're a country that produces seven times what we consume you know our our food and our drink exports are an enormous part of our um, part of our um, GDP they account for a significant part of that and we export seven times what we consume all around the world so and that's been achieved really I think by really developing our agribusiness we're also trying to support on the dairy side because we have a very very big dairy industry so now we're working so our equivalent of Calro through with our with support from the embassy the Irish equivalent of Calro is working with Calro up in Naivasha and we've got a really great program there where we're looking at trying to identify the most suitable type of dairy animals for the for the particular area that they're in trying to identify the most suitable forage for those animals so that not only is it really nutritious and productive and you're getting the most productive animal but that it's also reducing the cost to farmers in terms of inputs and it's also climate smart so it's reducing the impact on the environment but at the end of that what we hope to have is an economic breeding index which is what Ireland developed and was really critical to us but that'll show which are the most productive animals and how they should be fed and a lot of it is with forage that farmers can grow themselves and with that program so there's a lot of research and development going on with Calro and Naivasha but we're developing innovation nodes so that that research can actually go out into the communities and and farmer field schools so that farmers can be trained on it then on the private sector side we've worked with Keninvest and um, Kepsa primarily with Keninvest it was around sharing our experience of attracting FDI and um, because again I mentioned earlier Ireland doesn't have huge resources so we've really worked hard to attract foreign direct investment so we have a huge sector like nine of the top ten computer companies are based in Ireland pharmaceutical companies are based there for their European usually Middle East and African headquarters they're based out of Ireland and um, and again I mean education is critical to that having a highly educated population is very important to that so again trying to share the lessons with Ken invest so what we did with Ken Invest was we supported them to develop a one-stop shop for investors. So if you're a foreign investor looking to direct looking to invest in Kenya, you can now go to Ken Invest and within a day, you know, you can literally go around their booths and you can talk to people about everything from regulations to energy supply to visas to you know recruitment and, and all of the aspects that you know you'd need to know if you're an investor basically and also we've helped them develop their customer um, cu customer software and then with Kepsa it's really been a big focus on trying to support women entrepreneurs to develop their enterprises as well and then of course we responded to COVID as well last year we you know we reprogrammed more than a quarter of our development funding very quickly to try to support Kenya's response to COVID I mean the whole world was grappling with COVID Ireland was grappling with it so we um, we very quickly provided some funding to help the most vulnerable in informal settlements with you know s small monthly cash payments that could help them you know just get through this very difficult period we provided funding to organizations that were supporting those at risk of or victims of sexual and gender-based violence we provided some funding to help trade flow you know because again COVID of course really impacted trade which is just the lifeblood of companies so we gave some funding to help particularly trade on bus at the Busia air end of things to help keep that flow and we tried to support the coordination through the UN then as well we tried to support the coordination between the center of government and the counties because at that moment that was an area that was identified as needing support in order for things to work effectively so those are some of the big areas that we're we're engaged in and um, you know and, and and really really happy to be working in those areas because I think you know as two countries we have so much in common and so much shared experience so and of course you know in all of these programs that we're working with through our development funding 
Ireland's also learning a lot, right? These are real partnerships where there's a lot of, you know, back and forth. So we have, oftentimes we'll have, you know, say people from Calro who go to Ireland and, and visit some of our, our key agricultural institutions, but then they're bringing Kenyan experience and learning and understanding to Ireland as well. So it's very much, um, it's very much a two-way process always with these programs. Well, Lozi, as we conclude this conversation, uh, it would be a lot of disservice to our viewers if I don't ask you this question. What interesting thing should they know about Ireland? Tell us more about, probably majority of Kenyans know Ireland because of uh, the famous Irish whiskey, Jameson, okay. and, and of course Guinness. And of course Guinness, <laughs> yes, yes. I think they probably also should be aware of um, they might also be interested to know that as such a small country, we have this very large diaspora. In my experience of being here, Kenyans often know of Ireland through Irish missionaries, right? Because of course, Irish missionaries came out and many of them set up really excellent, often very, very often health and education institutes. So the Loreto sisters and a Loreto sister at least set up the first um, Catholic girls school. You know, there's brother Colm O'Connor, of course, who's training. He's the Irish um, Irish brother who's up in, in Iten and has trained David Rudisha and many of the Kenyan, like, you know, super successful athletes. Um, but I suppose Ireland, Irish people here played a role in things that we may not know about. So, for example, I was really interested to learn that our state air, airlines, Aer Lingus, supported Kenya Airways to set up, you know, back in, back in the day. Um, Ireland was very involved, I think, in, in, in supporting, again, the development of coffee coffee as, as a major commercial crop. And there's about, you know, the, the population here, the Irish population, well, pre-COVID at least, I think some older people left and went home at, at the time that COVID struck, but it was around 2,500, which is not insignificant, really. And probably what a lot of people might not realise about Ireland is our population now is coming close to 5 million, right? Our diaspora is estimated at 72 million people around the world. So if you go to the United States of America, for example, about one in 10 people is of Irish heritage. Um, if you go to Boston, where my last posting was, I was posted to Boston, it's one in four people claim Irish heritage. So you'll find Irish people or people of Irish origin all over the world. And the genesis of that, the origins of that are quite sad. We spoke earlier about the famine and in the, during the course of the famine, about two million Irish people left our shores and went to mostly to the UK or the US or to Canada. But I mean, we're a small island on the western edge of Europe. And I think in our, you know, in our DNA almost is the urge to travel. Um, and very often, you know, even now, Irish people will go abroad for a couple of years and come home, you know. But I think maybe that's the interesting thing is we're such a small country and yet we have this huge footprint across the world in terms of our, our diaspora. And that's, um, that's something that's very special to us that's, uh, that, um, that we really cherish, I guess, the, 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 having those connections right across, right across the world. Thank you so much, Balozi Queenland, for gracing this episode of The Diplomat. My pleasure. Thank you.